This is George Butler reporting live from the Target Center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're concluding a very beautiful broadcast so far. We've been up and running for five hours and 42 minutes. Non-stop. We're going to be uh, making, uh, having some interviews here shortly. We've got some very close people to Ron Paul's campaign from South Texas, from Lake Jackson area. We've got Bruce Bullock and also uh, Deborah Medina. Both of those people have been very close associates of Ron Paul and they've done a very fine job. We're going to be bringing them onto the camera here in just a second. Otherwise, let me give you a rundown on what's been going on here. Okay, this is George Butler reporting. We're live from the Target Center in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota. We're going to be joined shortly by two very close supporters and, uh, gosh, campaign managers and, and, and vice chairmen of, of several of his campaigns, of Ron Paul's campaigns in South Texas. We're going to be uh, joined shortly by Bruce Bullock, and he's a do-run-run man. He, uh, he took his uh, van, and, and actually he has these personalized license plates to that effect on his vans. Also, uh, Deborah Medina has been a driving force in that area. For uh, There was some legislation, uh, litigation recently that she was involved in against the Texas Republican Party. She'd been a very much of a driving force in that area in support of Ron Paul. We've been broadcasting live uh, from the Target Center in downtown Minneapolis, Minnesota for over five hours. We've, we've been taking some live feeds from the Target crew and their professionally manned cameras and streaming that out live to GCNlive.com. So if you want to see the rest of this uh, rally for the republic, tune in to GCNlive.com. You can also see it on GreenCity.com. You can see it on TheSecretTruth.com and also WorldReview.tv. We are just overtaken by the enthusiasm by the crowd here today. And especially, there have been some hot-button issues. Some of those issues have to do with um, the Federal Reserve System. And that Federal Reserve System is, is, is really uh, very, very sensitive to most people's uh, sensitivities these days. What, what they're concerned about is they want to get back to an honest money system. Ron Paul, on November 2nd, standing on the Independence Mall, in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, stated, he looked out over 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 to his right, and he said, uh, "Okay, Charlotte Littlefield Brown is going to join me, and we're going to to get some uh, her comments and impressions." Hey, Charlotte, join me. What are your comments and impressions? What's going on here today? Well, it's electrifying. There's a lot of people. There's um, it's just a uh, thousands of people in a huge building celebrating uh, freedom, liberty. Celebrating Ron Paul, um, Amy Allen's on stage right now, and we're not going to be—we're not going to be uh, broadcasting that for, uh, I guess, copyright reasons or something along those lines. Let's see. Um, it's just an amazing experience, and um, the feeling here is very—I'm <laughs> sorry, I'm very tired. I just climbed the whole building. It's a, it's a giant center here, uh, looking for <laughs> different people. Anyways, um, Ron Paul. Uh, oh, well, we have an interview. Yes, that's what I do. I do interviews. Bruce, we're gonna have Bruce Bullock from. Ron Paul's hometown. This, hello, Bruce. How are you? All right. Say hello to the Ron Paul supporters. Hello, Ron Paul supporters. Okay, Bruce. Let's go ahead and tell the audience a little bit about yourself and uh, how you came to support Ron Paul all those years ago. Well, it's only been like 13 years ago that I got started, and that was uh, I met him at a Christmas party. Uh, 
that was put on by the Port of Freeport. And I told him that I wanted to work on his campaigns with him because uh, I liked the message that I heard from him. And I didn't know that he actually only lived about two and a half blocks from me and uh, became very excited. I've been working on his campaign every every other year uh, since 19 what? Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. 19... 90, uh, 95? 94. 94. Yeah. And uh, just so pleased to be able to do everything I can for him because this man is a genuine person. He cares about people. Uh, he cares about everybody that works for him and every time he comes back from Washington to run his campaign he tells us he's got to win by a bigger margin because he's got to show those people back in Washington that you can stand up for what is right and you can go back and win because they tell him we agree with you Ron but if I did what you do, I can't possibly win. All right. So tell us about your trip up here. So when did you arrive? Well, we arrived uh, Saturday afternoon. Okay. How would you spend your time yesterday? Uh, let's see. I was uh, at the Leadership Summit. Please, tell us about the Leadership Summit. Give us some of your, your thoughts about how that went and what are your thoughts about that? Well, at the Leadership, leadership Summit, uh, we talked about our plans for the future and how we need to energize the public. We need to energize people. This is our revolution and we need to do something about it because otherwise we lose this country. And the reason I'm so involved is because I feel like my generation has let this country down. The Constitution is there to protect us from government, but the Constitution can't protect itself. It takes us to do it. And too many people, too many people in this country are not vigilant about what the politicians are doing to us. And I tell them, look, if you don't want to pay attention to politics, the politicians aren't going to pay attention to you. So I certainly intend to make them pay attention to me. Unfortunately, my congressman is Ron Paul, so I can't complain to him. <laughs> He's got it right already, right? That's outstanding. Okay, so um, have you been here at the at the, uh, the where are we anyways? The National Sports Center. We're at the uh, Target Center where they play NBA basketball. Right, uh, National Sports Center. Um, Target is the uh, corporate sponsor. Yes, I believe so. Right. Although although the, the although the public pays for it with their taxes, they sell the, the the owners of the of the team get to sell the naming rights and. The public gets to pay higher prices. And that's how that goes. Right. So um, you've been here uh, since they opened the doors, and what is your impression on the crowd? I'm uh, a little disappointed in the crowd, but simply because, and I, want, I don't want to talk negative, I need to talk positive, but I know that they sold out all the seats, okay? They sold out all the seats, but the people that bought them because they wanted to contribute money to the campaign and make sure that 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 uh, we did fill the place, unfortunately, I believe didn't didn't hand out those tickets to to friends or people that could come. And after all, we are back in the school year, so a lot of people couldn't come because they've got. Sure, today's a work day. No, don't misunderstand. There are thousands of right. people out there. Um, there are thousands of people. I repeat, it is very busy, very packed. Everything's very energized. However, um, like uh, Bruce was saying, it, it appears that, well, today was a work day, too. Today's right. a Tuesday, and I've got a sneaky suspicion that as the rush hour begins, that people are going to start flooding into this place. That's a hope. Yeah, um, because uh, we do have some empty seats, but the floor is absolutely packed. The perimeter is all the way to the top. This is a huge stadium. Our, it's just a huge arena. I think it seats 15,000. I don't know for sure. I believe that's what they've said, yes. Right, and and we definitely have a presence here, folks. I don't know what the official number is, you know, as far as that goes. Um, but uh, no disappointments here. And we've had fabulous, energized speakers. What do you think about the way we all get to come together in this media format and, and actually have the speakers, the people, the authors, that the books that we respect, the um, former politicians, people that are running for office actually get up and address us what do you think about that dynamic well I think it's great it helps energize these people that much more to hear these people speak like this 
it invigorates people like me. Uh, it makes me want to go out and do even more. And I try to do everything I can. I, if I'm not at work to earn a living, I'm at work for Dr. Paul and for the Campaign for Liberty. Absolutely. Us too. And, of course, uh, Jesse Ventura was just on, and he just energized the crowd. He was outstanding. Um, so far today, which speaker were you into the most? Well, I like Jesse because of his, uh, his, his enthusiasm up there and, and, and uh, because he has been against the establishment all along. So he fits right in there with Ron. And we all understand it's the establishment that's controlling everything, and that's why Ron isn't over there at that other convention doing what he should be doing. Right. And, of course, the opening, uh, was, the opening uh, prayer was by, I believe her name was uh, White. She's, yeah, I think it was Barbara White, um, and she's uh, running for Congress. And um, she's actually been over at the Republican uh, National Convention. She's going back and forth. A lot of the people in the building, and that's another thing, they're going from this facility over to the other facility. We have actual delegates and alternate delegates um, jumping back and forth between the two facilities. So that, that's kind of another dynamic that's here. Uh, what do you think about the, um, the, the area, the, the people here? You know, they've had a lot of protesters in the streets. They've had apparently some anarchists that a small group of people not affiliated with um, some of the other causes. Uh, the people that marched yesterday, they, they weren't a collected group. They were a bunch of, of different groups coming together, right? Yeah, and whatever, whoever did that property damage, you know, that, that's a severe negative. Um, what do you think about the property damage? Well, I wasn't aware of the property damage, but, but one of my concerns coming up there, I happened to talk to a meetup leader from up here uh, before I came up, and he told me that, uh, that uh, his wife was a police officer, and they were being trained to how to handle the crowds and anticipating some problems. And he said there was going to be a very large anarchist group up here, a very large leftist group up here, and Ron Paul people. And I said, my fear is that the media is going to mix them all together and say these are all Ron Paul people out here causing all these problems. I don't think it's happened yet. No, I'm not getting a sense of that at all. And, and whoever did the property damage uh, in this beautiful city, uh, the, the Minneapolis-St. Paul is a beautiful area. And uh, very nice people out in the community, in the city. It's just, it's, this is America, is it not? Yeah, I mean, this is this, quintessential this, America. This is, uh, uh, what do they call it, uh, middle America? That's what it is. It's middle America, very down-to-earth people. So um, that's very positive. So now tonight, um, Ron Paul is going to be speaking. Um, I think we're a little bit behind schedule. Are you aware of that? Yeah, we got started late. <laughs> Right, and um, these things happen, I, I guess. I'm not sure how we started late, but we... Well, we got started late because people couldn't get in through security very easily. It took a while to get everybody through security, I think. Right. And um, as far as the uh, security that's been hired for this, uh, they've been very diligent. I, I feel secure and safe in here. I mean, I, I think it's great. I, my concern was that some of the anarchists would try to do something against the Paul campaign to make us seem like uh, you know, we're at that level, and, of course, we're not at that level. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, well, no, this, this, this group is all about obtaining our liberty through a peaceful revol resolution. Revolution, and that's all, about, that's all about telling the people in our communities that they need to start paying attention, that they need to get involved. And it doesn't take very much to turn things around. But if we don't start doing it pretty quickly, it's going to be very, very difficult to turn around without more violent means. Right. Um, now, of course, I know you came up from Texas. Um, what do you think about the Bush administration and John McCain? Uh, you know, basically the Republican National Convention was cut back significantly due to a Category 3 hurricane. I guess immediately when it hit landfall, it went down to one. Um, do you think there's a possibility they don't want to compete with this thousands and thousands of people that have turned out in support of Ron Paul because we might actually have more numbers than them? What I, what I think they they want to do is they want to they want to give uh, McCain the uh, the nomination by acclamation as Hillary did with the Democrats for Obama because they fear they fear a brokered convention and so they don't want that to happen and so whatever they can do whatever excuse they can use to shorten that convention and push things through they're going to do. 
Right. And we had some reports uh, from people that were guests of the Republican National Convention, Bruce, and they said that there were actually teleprompters. They, um, it's as if they're just going through the motions. They're not having a genuine convention. It's more like a staged event. Well, I went through the Texas State Republican Convention, and that was a staged event. It was hypocrisy, in my opinion. Uh, the delegates never had a chance to speak. Uh, the delegates never had a chance to really vote on anything. There were a lot of challenges against our state Republican Party, but all of them were swept under the table, and the majority of the delegates had no idea what was going on. But the people that had those challenges were made to look like they were just there to cause chaos. I know. Um, well, I was in uh, Texas Senatorial District 14. They actually sent out a um, an automated uh, from the Republican Party of Texas from my senatorial district. They sent out an automated um, phone call to all of us who were in the Republican Party, and it said, "Okay, this is how you're supposed to vote." vote this on this resolution, vote this on that resolution, telling me how to vote. And then they said, and oh, by the way, a renegade group is going to be at our convention, so be prepared. And when I arrived at my senatorial convention, there was a grandmother like lady in a, in a straw hat with a flag on it saying, demanding from the chairman, because uh, I believe it was his voice on the recording. I, I, I shouldn't say that. I can't verify that. But um, demanding an apology from the chairman, nevertheless, uh, for being called for being labeled a renegade <laughs> well I'll tell you what we've got someone here that I hope you will interview a uh, Deborah Medina who was right in there with us uh, as you know she would ran for for uh, state uh, co-chairman of the party or vice chairman excuse me and Deborah is a real fighter she's worked with with Ron uh, in his in his uh, 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 primary campaign for uh, uh, re-election to the to the house and uh, Deborah has all the integrity that Ron has and I can't wait for you to talk to her because this woman works from her heart right yeah I, I did interview her in the past George and I did uh, I think down in Lake Jackson okay. yeah and uh, we'd love to do it again and of course I think I interviewed her on Ron Paul Revolution Radio a long time ago uh, when that you know was starting but um, okay so where do we go from here Bruce uh, do you think this is going to help energize and facilitate real political change in America? Well, I know going back to Lake Jackson it will. <laughs> Why is that? Because we're going to make it happen. Oh, oh, so we have to make it happen. That's right. We have to make it happen. Outstanding. It's not going to happen on its own. You can tell it's not going to happen on its own. It's going to take a few good people to make it happen. All right, Bruce. Well, look who we have with us. Okay. Hi, Deborah. Hi, Deborah. How are you? Charlotte Littlefield Brown, we met. I do apologize. Uh, give me your full name. Deborah Medina. Deborah Medina. And I, uh, you've had a lot of different hats on in the last 18 months. I have. Yes. I have. Um, when I first, uh, when we first encountered you, you were working uh, actively on his uh, congressional, congressional campaign. His congressional yeah. campaign. Why don't, tell us a little bit. Uh, we're going to start with that history, and then we're going to, when, uh, then when you branched off and you started your own thing, and where you're at today and where you're going, okay? So tell us about supporting Ron Paul in his uh, congressional district. What what has that been like in this presidential season? Well, actually, I've kind of grown up, I think, politically under Ron Paul's tutelage. Wharton County sits right in the center of his congressional district, um, and I was at a place that I could step up and help um, work on the congressional campaign where there was so much focus nationally on the presidential campaign. Ron still felt very strongly about taking care of the district at home and so it was a privilege to step in and, and speak on his behalf around the district but we, uh, as we talked about that in the beginning of the campaign, my job was to come in and help win the primary and help work with him in the district to do that and once the primary was done, since he didn't draw an opponent in the general election, that, that role and that position was pretty much over. I've been a grassroots activist uh, certainly in Wharton County for a, no a long time, as well as around uh, the greater kind of Gulf Coast region of Texas. My Senate district is Senate District 18. It encompasses 19 counties, uh, which is a little bit larger than Ron's uh, congressional district, and not exactly the same area, but I'm basically pretty familiar with that. Uh, as a result of that, I began to do a lot of traveling and teaching. There are a lot of new activists 
um, that want to be involved. And the Republican Party needs voters, and we need voters all over the country. We certainly need voters in Texas. Uh, I've spent my life in politics trying to encourage people to participate in the public square, to engage in the debate, to be a part of it. I know that you know the price of freedom is eternal vigilance. We have to be watching for that every day. So it was a real privilege for me to be able to travel and talk to these individuals that wanted to get involved. Unfortunately, they didn't get the same welcome from the Republican Party of Texas. Yeah, that was a very bizarre experience. Very bizarre. Uh, to get involved in politics for the first time and where you're trying to go, they sort of reject you and keep you at hand's length. Yeah, that was very discouraging. So um, you've, had, you've been teaching and consulting and helping to educate us. I know uh, for a fact this was my first uh, precinct convention, my first senatorial district convention. I didn't have a clear understanding of the delegate process. I didn't understand exactly how locked up the political process genuinely is, how you know it's dictated down to us. You know, um, I'd, I'd like to get your thought on this. You know, at local uh, Republican Party on a local level, okay, they have rules committees, chairmen, and these things. I, I thought it would be a good idea to get in onto the rules committee and make some fundamental rule changes and say you can be in the Republican Party and you don't have to swear allegiance to who is filtered down to you from the national level. And so that you retain your independence and you retain your ability to have political dialogue. Um, and so if this was repeated around the United States, uh, basically where the local Republican Party was saying, we're going to retain our voice, thank you very much, uh, what kind of impact do you think that would have on the overall Republican structure? Well, you know, we've seen uh, a very interesting dichotomy here as we're in Minnesota this week, maybe as a good example of that. We've got the RNC delegation uh, convention, of course, going on across town. I've been here since Saturday working with the Campaign for Liberty, Rally for the Republic. But we have had two days of meetings here. They weren't scripted um, to a large degree. We had uh, very intense training on Sunday, followed by a summit yesterday where there was actual dialogue and discussion. And I think that um, nobody really had any idea where that was going to go. It was particularly meaningful that Texas, um, after the rally at the Blaine Stadium last night, filled up one section of bleachers. We had probably well over 150 people there, which is more delegates than Texas has in total at the RNC convention. Uh, they were here for the rally. We, um, we had a temporary chair stand up as temporary chair, and we followed parliamentary procedure rules, and we elected a chairman, and we did business until 2.30 this morning out under the parking lot lights. Um, finding out what do the people of Texas want to see the Campaign for Liberty do, how do they want to change their state, how do they want to change their local community. Um, they elected four of us to represent them in a meeting of about uh, 13 states this morning and so we had some additional discussion early this morning where there's dialogue and we're trying to seek wisdom and figure out what's the best way to take all of this energy to harness it to, for change in our country. It, it truly is a revolution. It is a wonderful thing to be a part of and really energizing after having felt apathy. I think we all have this sense of apathy in our in our public square and the, and the reason for the apathy is because there's such a divide between what people say and what they do. America's looking for authentic leadership for people that do what they say that mean what they say. We heard that from the governor just earlier that you know he did what he said he was going to do and that excites people and so it's been wonderful to be up here in Minnesota um, and to be a part of this process. Right, and that's and that's that's fabulous. I'm so glad you brought us up to date. So, did anybody discuss the possibility of uh, as we because we're I am a, a registered Republican right now, and if I so choose to get involved and to uh, work my way into these positions of leadership at my local level, um, there's nothing stopping me from changing the rules, is there? Well, I'm not sure if we're talking to a multi-state audience here. I'm very familiar, of course, with the technology. You're national and potentially worldwide. Okay. Well, uh, I can speak particularly to Texas. Most states are going to have some kind of election law that stipulates uh, the overall prevailing rules, and then the party is going to have separate rules. I can speak to Texas. In Texas, we don't have party registration. We affiliate with the party by virtue of which primary we vote in. That 
does not a marriage make? It does not a permanent lifetime commitment make? It allows you to affiliate with that party and to participate in setting the rules for the party. You don't write the election code. You don't change the law. But certainly you can have a voice or should be able to have a voice in writing the rules for the party, um, writing the platform for the party, the statement of beliefs for the party. What does this party believe? What does it want to see its elected leadership do? And then uh, elected officials do. And then electing the leadership for the party, which serves as its executive committee to carry out the will of the delegates between conventions. So at the RNC convention this week, they're going to write National Republican Party rules. They're going to adopt a National Republican Party platform and they're going to, the states have actually elected National Republican Party leadership. It will be that leadership's job, in theory, to see to it that the rules that are passed here this week are followed, that the platform that's passed is implemented to the degree possible throughout the legislative process. Um, but mostly what you hear about that is that it's very scripted, and, and really what's happening up here is a foregone conclusion, and it's a big party. That's not what's going on at the Campaign for Liberty um, rally this week. There is actual discussion and dialogue, people trying to seek that wisdom that our founders understood when they gave us the right to assemble, that it was for purposes of coming together collectively. When we're together collectively, America is able to come up with solutions that will improve our country and the world. So you personally, I personally view the Democrat and the Republican parties as ineffective, divisive. Uh, they stand in my the way of me as an American using my voice politically. They are so intertwined in the electoral system. They have the state of Texas, the state of Texas taxpayers giving them money to run their primaries. That where did you know? When did we cross that bridge? When did the taxpayer money start supporting the Democrat and Republican Party? That's a problem. These are ideas. The, uh, the parties should be about dialogue, about ideas. The money's all mixed up. We got power problems. It, 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 to me, it's evolved. It's, I realize it's been there 150 years, but it's evolved to the point that um, you know maybe we just got to tear it all down and start over. I don't know. Besides going in and at the local level and saying, you know, look, I am the Republican Party of my county, my district, whatever, okay, and saying these are my rules and these are the rules, and I shall be dictated to by the national level about who I will or will not endorse. Because this was my first rodeo, getting in the political process, and the door was shut in my face. And I'm a military veteran, okay? And I was faced with people saying, yeah, but this is the Republican Party. You know, this is, if you're going to be in the political process, you got to come in and swear an oath to who they tell you to nominate. And I'm like, no, no, this is all messed up. This is all backwards. It's being dictated down to us. How are we going to overcome it being dictated down to the local level? Well, I think a big part of what we're doing here, at least, is trying to educate people. We certainly want to become a part of that leadership. We recognize that we've got a two-party system in the United States. That's the way to really impact public policy. In the meantime, in those areas where we don't have a majority voice within the party, there's nothing that stops us from organizing at the local level and, and, and doing the same things we would be doing if we were involved in the party, and that's trying to uh, impact and affect our government and our public policy. It starts at the lower level. I, I had an opportunity to speak before a group yesterday and I shared with them that in, in many ways we train our politicians. We train them when they're on the school board. We train them when they're on the city council. We train them when they're uh, a state representative that they don't have to follow the law, that we're not going to hold them accountable and that they can do whatever they want. And then when they get to Washington DC all of a sudden we say, oh my gosh, there's no accountability in government. It starts when that elected official is serving in his very first elected, elected office. It starts when they're working within the party, at the lower levels, when they're working in their local government. And if we would begin to hold those officials accountable to the beliefs that we have written down into our party platforms, that we have stated at the grassroots level, that we've come together in our precinct conventions and in our local communities and said, these are our rules. This is what we want out of our elected officials and held them accountable then we would see more accountability out of government at home and from Washington, D.C. And that's what we're doing here. I think we're building an army of people who understand that and who truly are energized to go home and begin to do the hard work necessary to secure our freedom. Right, and that would include, like, planning meetings years in advance. Am I wrong? So we should be looking ahead 
two years um, to the political process and say, okay, I want to be involved. I want to be a chairman. I want to get on uh, the Rules Committee of the Republican Party, whatever. I want to run for my local school board. We need to be thinking long term here, two years out, five year plan, you know, 25 meter target, 50 meter target, 100 meter target. That's right. There's, there's clearly a, con a political continuum. What, what has happened through this week sets the course for where this Republican Party is going to be in 2010. It's not really so much about who's going to be in the ballot on November 2008. It really is about the rules and the ideas that we want to see implemented in public policy over the coming two years and then who's going to be our candidates two years from now. And so if we wait until the filing deadline, January of 2010, to say, oh my gosh, who do we have to choose from? We're, yeah, we are, we are behind, and you bet, there are things going on right now where people are already looking forward to 2010. I know Ron's excited about that. He's excited about the amount of energy that's here. Uh, we're proud, Bruce and I both, to be from his congressional district and to have an opportunity to play a part in what's going on. Outstanding. Take us back to the early days. Um, I heard, or in fact, I think Bruce told me, or perhaps it was you, that in the early days, uh, people made VHS tapes of Ron Paul and his platform, VHS tapes, and passed them out door to door. Tell us, were you there for that? Um, I'm not sure I've, I've seen actual VHS tapes, but I've seen hand-painted signs for the congressional campaign. Um, we've done a lot of things over the years uh, to support him. He's got great support in his district and um, has been unopposed. I think two of the last three races has not drawn an opponent. People understand and appreciate what he does for us in Washington, D.C. He is very consistent on his policies. The casework that his office does is second to none. He's got an outstanding congressional staff uh, that's very responsive to the needs of the constituents in the district. Uh, I could tell you several personal stories about people that I know or calls that I've made on behalf of other individuals. Um, where his office staff just really goes to work. And so it's, it, he's just an outstanding individual, and he's an outstanding congressman. Right. Okay, so the concept of the VHS, though, is communication. Because at the root of America, you know, is, it's, uh, is communication. It's our voice. It's, it's what we do as Americans. We communicate. Uh, we, we told, you know, the Crown, you know, here's the, lo the, lo the uh, line in the sand. Here's the Declaration of Independence. Then we went on to form the constitution, everything. Okay, so communication is very important. Now we live in the age of DVDs, CDs. Um, how do you think those things could be, you know, besides documentary filmmaking, what way could we think out of the box to help move the uh, campaign uh, liberty forward using all the assets and all the resources that we have available to us? Well, I, prob I probably am, have got 20 years on, on the folks that could answer that question very well. You know, that's, that's something that's been really exciting in this campaign is to have so many 20 and early 30 year olds out there uh, coming up with those creative things. And I think we're way past uh, CDs and DVDs. We're doing, you know, streaming stuff and stuff on the internet um, that's way beyond my ability to talk about. I, I've been a, a benefit of being able to use some of that technology and get, and, and have it come into my uh, email box and uh, have it up on YouTube and Facebook and I mean the social networking sites. I think the Campaign for Liberty is planning on rolling out uh, a site uh, October 1st. We understand that's going to be really exciting and probably set the standard for political campaigning. Uh, so really exciting stuff going on as a result of all of these new people and all this new talent energy that the traditional Republican Party just didn't want to have anything to do with. So we're, we're, we're real beneficiaries of that energy and I really do believe that it's going to change the country for the good. Yeah, this is uh, the race is on. Now let's see if they can regulate the internet, huh? Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah they certainly are. Yeah. So, um, what you've been to a few of these type of events in your uh, political career? Um, what do you make of this particular crowd? Are the numbers as big as you were hoping? What's your feel for people's mentalities? I mean, mine is that people have come from all over the United States. I've met very few locals. <laughs> You know, people are telling me I'm from, you know, California, Washington, Florida, um, Idaho, Montana, Texas, and all the rest of you wonderful states. Um, what's your feel for this crowd? We had a, I, I agree, I think it's very diverse. I think it comes from across the country. As I mentioned earlier, we had a leadership summit yesterday that was the equivalent of a joint session of Congress. Every state in the union was entitled to bring one individual to the summit from each of the congressional districts in their state, as well as two at-large. Uh, related to two senators. So we essentially had a joint session of Congress 
that was packed. Every seat was full. Texas had a full delegation there. Um, we worked. Um, people felt involved. They felt engaged. They felt like they had a voice. Certainly, we're going through the growing pains of a new organization, and we've got great leaders at the top. Everybody has tremendous confidence in, in Congressman Paul. Um, he's got John Tate as the executive director, and he had a few words. Um, there were some folks in our delegation that said, boy, this is very different from our state convention. John Tate stood in front of that crowd. He answered some tough questions yesterday. People are wanting to make sure that we don't lose the momentum that's happening here, and they want to have a voice in where that's going. They want to respect what Congressman Paul and the leadership of the Campaign for Liberty is doing, but they want to make sure that we understand that this, and, and Ron says that all the time, this is a grassroots movement, and so we want to have make sure that that grassroots has a voice, and that happened yesterday um, in the Campaign for Liberty rally. Maybe not to the extent everybody wanted it to, but the door seems to be open, and that's why we had additional discussion this morning so that more communication can go back. Um, here today, I uh, actually was volunteering in one of the merchandise stores upstairs and saw people from, yeah, you're right, from all over the country that are here. Uh, it's, I don't know if, if your listeners can hear in the background, there's a lot of enthusiasm. Amy Allen's on stage right now, and she's, yeah, she's, she's having a good time with the crowd, and they're having fun with her. Balloons are flying. Um, the mood is very different. Um, the heart, I think, of people is very engaged. And in most political conventions, while there's a party atmosphere, there's not much a sense of I got to really participate and I got to have a voice and I got to affect what was going on. I don't think that's the case here. Everybody feels a part of this process. They've been able to engage in some way. They've walked neighborhoods. They've painted signs. They've They've used the social um, networking that's out there, the Facebook and the MySpace accounts, to spread the message of liberty and freedom throughout the United States. And so you, there's just a different atmosphere here because freedom motivates people and it encourages and inspires them. And you can feel that in this crowd. You can feel it on the floor, but you can feel it as you're walking around. People are interacting with the vendors, they're getting information, they're learning, and they're trying to improve and better their country to reestablish those constitutional principles that we all hold dear. And so it's, it's a great place to be and a, and, a, and a wonderful thing to be a part of. Right. Um, what about the money? Let's, can I, uh, you're going to stay, you got time? Are you good? Okay, great. Um, let's try to focus for them to, so they can see how good looking we are. <laughs> That, no vanity, folks. Um, oh, we got Richard Reeves here. Would you like to join us, Richard? Yeah, come on in. You know what? I'm gonna give the I'm gonna give the mic to Richard, and he's gonna interview Deborah for a while. Now you get a whole new set of questions. George, actually, George wanted you and I to talk about the events yesterday with the uh, rioters going on here in St. Paul. Okay. So. Okay. Yeah, but, but before we go, I want to know, um, more on the leadership, uh, before we totally get off, let's step over here a little bit, on the leadership summit, what is your next scheduled event for the, after, what came out of that, and what's your 50-meter uh, target on that? Well, my understanding is that there's still some details that need to be uh, worked out for the Campaign for Liberty at the national level. Um, at least the early word is that the states will be fairly autonomous, and so Texas met, as I said, till 2.30 this morning. Um, we've in, we've uh, elected four individuals whose job it will be to um, pr plan a meeting of some type. We're not sure if that will be one statewide meeting or if it will be some regional meetings around the state of Texas, but those meetings will occur between now and April 1st of next year. Uh, anyone and everyone that wants to participate in those meetings uh, as representatives to the Campaign of Liberty for Liberty will have an opportunity to do that, and it will be our goal at that meeting to um, write some bylaws to look at some objectives and some goals and to elect some type of leadership. But we anticipate that that will be fairly autonomous in each of the states. That's the information that we're being given by the Campaign for Liberty at this point. We certainly want to be responsive to their direction and, and not kind of jump the gun and get out of the gate too early. Um, but Texas is very energized by this. As I said, we had over 150 people at that rally last night, which is more delegates than we've got at the national convention. Um, and they are all committed to taking back their state and their country for, for the constitutional principles that we hold dear. So I, uh, I expect that we'll be seeing things in Texas in the next few months.
Outstanding. So one last question before you go. I wanted to make sure the listeners were clear about this. So there was an opportunity for every state uh, to be represented. Did we get 100% participation in uh, Campaign for Liberty? Did we get 100% all 50 states and territories? Or? You know, I, the room looked full yesterday. I know that we were very uh, gratified. Texas is a big state and Minnesota is a long way away. And, and we were very happy. Um, we had one delegate that drove from Brownsville, Texas, which is right down on the border of Mexico. He drove up and uh, he called us and said he was running a little late. He had had car trouble on the way and he had had to have his car repaired. But as soon as he got there, we had a full delegation. Um, I didn't do a, a head count around, but they, it, it looked full. We had five, I think there's a little over 500 uh, members in that group. And so uh, good participation from around the country. All right, well, thank you very much for your time. Yeah, thank you. Bye. All right, Richard Reeves. Welcome, Richard. Here, I'm going to give you the mic. And let me just set you up with a question. So yesterday, you were the boots on the ground um, with a camera. Uh, why don't you tell the listening audience a little bit about that? Well, Charlotte, first of all, I want to thank you and George Butler and Ted Anderson with GCNlive.com for helping sponsor us to be up here. And I really want to thank Ron Paul and all his staff. And most of all, I want to thank all of these people that are in this stadium that have gone, you know, the extra mile to be here and they've gone the extra mile in their home precincts, etc. They've canvassed for Ron Paul. They've done all the right things and it's just I hope that in the future that we continue with this momentum because that's how we can take over in twenty ten we can take over the Republican Party and get a bunch of Ron Paul type candidates elected. But uh, anyway about yesterday Basically, is uh, from 11 o'clock till uh, I think about 4 p.m. There was supposed to be a big protest rally, uh, an anti-war protest, and so. Uh, go ahead. Clarify that if that was not affiliated with Campaign for Liberty. That's right. Absolutely, it's totally separate, separate deal uh, from uh, what was going on with the Ron Paul events completely. Now there were Ron Paulers mixed in with the crowd because all of us, most of us, are almost an all anti-war as well. So they were actually uh, protesting because of the Republican National Convention. Right, they were down here protesting the RNC. They certainly weren't protesting the campaign for liberty, but uh, yeah, absolutely, uh, absolutely protesting the RNC. And uh, what what happened was, is at 11 o'clock, people started really gathering up there at the state capitol there in St. Paul. But there was a faction of uh, what I would define as anarchists, and also have been called in the press anarchists. And they, uh, the parade route was supposed to take off from the capitol at 1 p.m., but this particular group which consisted of uh, somewhere between two and 300 anarchists took off at about noon or 12.15. They took off early from the rest of the rally and started heading towards the uh, Excel Center away from the Capitol in St. Paul. And everything was going pretty well. The police uh, basically just allowed them to uh, go wherever they wanted to go, basically except for a certain perimeter around the Excel Center. Anytime they would get close to that perimeter, then they would always have that roped off with, uh, well, lined up with SWAT team, police, bicycle cops, you name it, all kinds of different law enforcement. They even had uh, National Guard or military of some type out there. I've got some photos of that. Somebody that knows what these uniforms are, I'm sure they could identify them easily what they were. But basically, they were down there trying to uh, penetrate that barrier, and what would happen is they would reach a dead end where they'd have SWAT team or, or military or other police, and they would turn around and take another way. So it was kind of like a little rat maze chess game going on down there all around St. Paul for hours and uh, at first the uh, provocations from the police were uh, pretty random they would they would isolate maybe one of the anarchists evidently for no reason now I didn't witness it myself but I would try to ask and find out if they were provoking the police and at first I think the police to show who was boss they would go in there and randomly pepper spray one or two of the anarchists uh, they wouldn't spray the whole crowd of them, but they would just spray one or two of them. And so I would come across, you know, one or two of them on the ground, and they would be treating them for the pepper spray and trying to, you know, pour uh, milk or something on them, I think, to help, you know, get that off of them. But uh, anyway, then uh, as time went on, though, finally the police got uh, a little more impatient, and then there was a small group. I think there were probably only one or two, maybe even three, three or so, that would really instigate... Uh, breaking out windows along the sidewalks, or uh, they uh, damaged the police car. They busted out all the windows of a police car, flattened a tire, and um, they would also throw, you know, how you have these little 
newspaper uh, dispenser boxes all along the roads that have the, the different corners that have the freebie magazines and also newspapers themselves. They would throw those out into the road, and they also got a dumpster <laughs> and rolled a dumpster out in the middle of the road and turned it over. But it was only a small cadre of these anarchists that were really doing all the damage. And one of the news reports I heard just today while I was driving <clears throat> is a lady saw the ones that were bashing out. There was two big store windows, picture, picture windows in a storefront that got bashed out. And she said that the police just sat there and watched this guy go by with a big uh, metal, metal rod that he busted out with, that they just watched him go by and didn't try to do anything to stop that activity. So she was thinking, you know, what's up with that, that they wouldn't actually go and grab some of these instigators right off the bat. So uh, anyway, that's, that's a little summary of what happened. It took about three or four hours, and finally, ultimately, what happened is the, uh, I guess the police started pepper spraying them, just kind of just in mass, and that happened. At, once they got on Kellogg Street, for some reason, when the anarchists got on Kellogg Street, the police is like, were like, no, you're not going to be on Kellogg Street. And they just flat out started pepper spraying and shooting uh, different tear gas, and smoke bombs, and things like that at them. And they got them off of Kellogg, and then they calmed down some and uh, just kind of let them run around a little bit longer for about another 30 minutes. But then somehow they just kind of surrounded them all finally in the end and ended up with about 230 arrests. 230 arrests of, of uh, alleged anarchists uh, do you, we don't know if these people call themselves anarchists or if the media labeled them anarchists or did they have shirts that said anarchists we don't know do we know well, why are we calling them anarchists well I would say mainly uh, you know they, they had a one banner that said uh, that it was an activist student group supposedly but uh, I'd call them anarchists as well because they really don't seem to have an agenda if you ask them well what are you protesting what what is this about they they really don't tell you they just tell you get away get away you know move away from me so these are uh, rebels without a cause I would say that's probably a decent description I, I don't know why that I mean I'm all for exercising the First Amendment which that's why I was with them is to make sure that they got a chance to exercise their First Amendment and they did and when I asked them questions about uh, like say what was going on with their cause they, they did they did not seem to have a cause other than they just wanted to come out and cause some, uh, ultimately cause some mayhem. Okay, and so they did property damage. Right. Uh, do we know of any injuries that occurred yesterday? Um, well, I don't personally know of any right this second, but I did witness uh, a situation where a bicycle policeman jumped one of the anarchists, and I just can't believe that nobody got hurt on that. Somebody had to have gotten hurt, whether it was the anarchist kid that was running away from the policeman or the policeman himself, because he did a pretty ugly face plant onto the pavement when he leapt off of his bicycle onto uh, the uh, the guy that was running. So I'd, I'd find it hard to believe that nobody got a little bit injured somehow. And I know I know for a fact there were uh, ambulances and paramedics called in to haul out a few people. They could have been anarchists and or cops, uh, both. I don't think anybody just uh, from the general public was uh, involved in any of that. But uh, lots of pepper spray everywhere. Uh, and when they finally did that big roundup, there were probably two or three ambulances that pulled people away from the scene on that. So um, I would say maybe five or ten people maybe got, got, had to go to the hospital, but I wouldn't be sure on that. Okay, what about the 9-11 Truth Movement? Were they represented uh, in yesterday's crowd? And do you know if the 9-11 Truth Movement, because there are a lot of activists here for the 9-11 Truth Movement, um, I count myself among them. Um, I happen to not be participating because I'm doing this, uh, but... So what is what happened yesterday, and what's going forward that you're aware of? Okay. Well, I've been pretty busy with all the activities with the broadcast and with the uh, anarchist situation and with the other Ron Paul events, but I did see 9-11 truthers in that crowd of the uh, peaceful protesters. There were probably two to 3,000. I saw a press report that said about 10,000 peaceful protesters in yesterday's march. So uh, one press report, 10,000. My view, I think there was probably two to 3,000, which is still, that's a pretty good turnout. And it mixed in amongst that crowd were a lot of Ron Paul people, because you could see them with their shirts. And I did see quite a few people wearing 9-11 inside job shirts. So there's plenty of 9-11 truth out there represented, mixed in with the anti-war effort. So it's exciting to see that uh, there's so many factions coming together on that peace march. Uh, it would have been good not to have the uh, anarchists 
breaking and damaging property because that puts a black eye on protesting in general, I think. Uh, I would love for them to just go ahead and exercise their First Amendment and uh, go ahead and say what they want to say and what their, what their purpose is about. And don't destroy property. That's not cool. Uh, people have a, a right to, to protect their life, liberty, and property. So uh, let's uh, talk about a few concepts here that perhaps were in play yesterday. Um, I'm not saying this happened, but the idea of uh, agent provocateurs, the idea of a psy operation, a psychological operation, where an event is, is created from scratch and a public perception is then, uh, you know, balloons out into the consciousness of the people. Um, my thought was, and perhaps you can, I'd like to hear your thought on this, is that if there was a, uh, an agent provocateur in that group, um, oh, tell us, okay, and I want you to tell us about the music. Oh, we forgot to talk about the music. Yeah, the, the anarchists and their music. Um, so let's say that there, there are some provocateurs in that group, then they rally up the crowd, and then they do property damage, and then what type of impression do you think that leaves in the, the minds of the people? For me, it leaves in the minds of the people that, well, boy, we need the National Guard and the military and all the police to protect us from this threat. Um, when, of course, the military should never be used on our streets to police the people. Uh, that's Pasa Comitatus, I believe, the concept of using military assets. But I'm getting, I am diverging. So uh, let's talk about, tell me about your thoughts on Agent Provocateur and tell me about the music. Okay. Well, Charlotte, uh, you're right. And I know we talked a little bit about this briefly earlier. Uh, it's unfortunate that here we have a cadre of two or three hundred folks. I mean, even right here, our little broadcast right now, they're overshadowing some of the other great events going on. They're overshadowing the great event last night with the, the Ron Paul event last night that was fabulous. We had uh, thousands in, in attendance. Amy Allen was there, and we had uh, Rocky Lynn. So many great things going on. We've got this big rally at the Target Center as we speak at the moment. Uh, so it's unfortunate that that's exactly right, that these things are a distraction. On talk radio, I've listened to a little bit of talk radio today when I'm uh, riding around in the car a little bit on different errands and things like that that I've been having to do today. And that's what's dominating talk radio here in Minnesota, in St. Paul and Minneapolis area, is they're, they're focusing on this group. So it really does a lot of harm in, in a lot of ways. It does neutralize the press that these bigger groups should be getting. For instance, those two or 3,000 uh, uh, pro-peace people, they should be getting a lot more press. I mean, they had the numbers out there. They had the big numbers. And so that's, that's kind of a bad deal right there for the uh, other protest groups that are going out there and exercising their First Amendment peacefully without uh, doing all this uh, d property damage. But uh, you're right. And one thing I did witness is that it was a very small nucleus of people within that uh, two or three hundred anarchist group it was probably only six or seven people that were really getting getting with it and one of the things uh, that they had going on and you just referenced it a little while ago was about the music is they basically had uh, like those radio flyer type two of those wagons and I gotta hand it to them my hats off to them that was really ingenious how they had these PA systems set up in these little wagons and those things were blasting they were really they were loud they were blasting, and so they had some crazy music playing and all that to whoop up their uh, energy and whoop up their crowd. And uh, my hat's off to them. I took a bunch of photos of that because we need to do that type of thing to have our PA going for some of our events when we're doing parades and rallies and uh, you know and our protests, etc. So I handed to them. On, my hat's off to them on that. But uh, yeah, they did have uh, some of their hip hop crazy music and probably that, uh, music that I'm not even aware of exactly what it is. But uh, that really revved them up and got them hyped up to uh, take off. And I, I think, like I said, it could have been as little as one or two of the uh, anarchists in there that uh, potentially uh, provocateurs, who knows. But just one or two of them would be enough to all of a sudden get six or seven or eight to do, you know, throw out a bunch of newsstands out into the road. And, uh, you know, you had one of them jump up on a police car with the policeman in it. You know, the policeman's in there, and he gets up there, and he's doing a jig and a dance up on top of the police car, and that cop starts jumping out. But that, that, get, that kid's so spry and fast that when he started running, that cop knew that, forget it, he wasn't going to catch him. So uh, 
but uh, you know. all that with music in the background. Am I to get this right? So the music's blaring, oh, yeah. the kids jumping up on that, and uh, so yeah, using music's very emotional. It gets yeah. people revved up. That's why we use it. There's music at this rally. Amy, Amy uh, Allen, and of course Rocky Lynn last night. So music's all key to that. So that's real interesting. Tomorrow, do you know what the 9/11 Truthers are doing uh, in the vicinity in the next day or two? You know, I don't know. Uh, maybe you know more about that than I do. I don't know. I'm sure that I know they're here. I know uh, we've got probably thousands of them out here in force. And uh, maybe uh, the ones that are staying here after the Target Center event will probably be down at the RNC uh, wearing T-shirts, passing out literature and DVDs, etc. Uh, I don't know if there's anything planned and organized. Like I say, maybe you do. But uh, the, uh, the 9-11 truth is just catching fire more and more and more. Uh, it's almost getting to where it's common knowledge. I know in my work that I do in Austin, I talk to people all the time, and I remember in 01, shortly after 9-11, that it was like uh, plowing a 10-acre field with a teaspoon. You know, I mean, it was really hard work to uh, get people awake and to get people to see the inside job aspects of 9-11. But now it feels like, uh, you know, I feel like Eddie Arnold out of Green Acres, you know, my little green John Deere tractor, you know, and I'm plowing. And I'm plowing, so it's and that, I think it feels that way for everybody that we're finally kind of really, you know, lifting off and taking off, and this Ron Paul campaign kind of um, kind of proves that to me because I've seen our movement just grow and grow and grow. And I remember in uh, late December '06 and early January '07, um, one of the things that wasn't happening for us is that there was no way to get all these individual people that are awake all over the United States, there was no way for them to really connect with one another. Even if they lived, you know, in their own neighborhood, they, they wouldn't even know their fellow patriot out there. And one of the beautiful things, the, one of the most beautiful things to me about the Ron Paul campaign is that with the Meetup Group tool of the meetup.com website, it helped people network together all over the United States. And those groups, those Meetup Groups are forever, hopefully, going to continue working and growing and uh, now it's just going to be unstoppable, I think. Right. So there was sort of a, a parallel phenomenon happening with uh, 9-11 information, Ron Paul information, the synergy, uh, everything that came together. Not everybody that's a 9-11 truther is necessarily a Ron Paul supporter. Not everybody that's a Ron Paul supporter is necessarily a 9-11 truther. Um, but we're talking. America's talking. And this is good. So did you talk to any Democrats out in the crowd yesterday? Did they, uh, what did they think about the RNC? What did they think about their, their protest? Well, yesterday uh, mainly was focused, uh, for me personally, on uh, actually staying with the anarchists. We, uh, Terry Melton, uh, who runs the camera out of Austin, and uh, Val, uh, we were working together to mainly watch for police state activities. So we weren't really talking to uh, any of the Democrats or the, uh, the mainline peace protesters. We weren't uh, really there for that. We were mainly focusing on where we thought there was going to be trouble. And so that's what we did. And in the times that I did attempt to talk with the anarchists and ask them questions, I was immediately, you know, almost attacked. As a matter of fact, at one point, I was attacked. At one point, what happened was uh, I was calling Terry on the telephone and telling him exactly where I was so he could come meet with me so he could video some of the things. He wanted to video some of the things that were going on. And one of the kids overheard me giving a location. Uh, I can't remember what the location was. And he just, boom, just assumed I was a cop. And right in the midst of this 200, 300-person anarchist group, he starts saying, cop, 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 you know. And, I, and he starts grabbing at me. And so I kind of start walking out of the crowd. And uh, they started to attack me. And I just turned around and said, look, I'm not a cop. I'm just here, you know, watching for police state activity. And, but they made me leave at that point. They made me leave. And so at least they, they didn't crushed me right then like a bug but that's what could have happened it was a, a tense moment right there that did make me sweat at that moment but uh, later on I was kind of able to slip back in and uh, one of them ID'd me later and got me on video and asked me a few questions I answered them for him but uh, basically after that it, it was okay but for a little bit I was really afraid to get back in that mix it was pretty crazy you're braver than I I wouldn't go in that mix for all the money in the world well maybe all the money in the world now I don't know uh, thank you for your service thank you it's those things are very important uh, do you have something else uh, yeah, wish you could talk George about? George, Please do. Yeah, George wanted me to add that uh, I want to make sure everybody stays tuned in to our webcast here because some of the people we have coming up are Barry Goldwater Jr. is going to be coming up. For sure? Yep, Barry, who, who Barry Goldwater Jr. Who locked it in? Well, it's on the schedule. It's right there on the schedule. 
Barry oh, Galwell Jr. Broadcast. Yeah, on the broadcast, <laughs> coming in on the broadcast. Not yeah, outside. Here, folks. Well, we don't know about out here. Who knows what could, what could anything could happen right here, right here with right. Charlotte? Yeah, so anything could happen. Who knows who we might get? But Barry Goldwater Jr. is going to be for sure on the live webcast there in the Target Center, along with Jimmy Bond, Ron Paul, and Sarah Evans. Those are coming up, so make sure and stay tuned there. And uh, hopefully, we're going to keep having some uh, great interviews right here with some other folks. So, okay. Charlotte, I'm, I'm going to throw it back to you. Oh, you're giving it back to me. Yeah, okay, sure. great. Well, sir, come on up. All right. I'm Charlotte Littlefield Brown. I'm uh, Matthew Heath from Sonoma County, California. Matthew Heath from Sonoma County, California. Sonoma County. Sonoma County, California. Yeah, now north of San Francisco and uh, just uh, west of Napa County. I went to Napa Valley College for a full semester, All took right. a full load, and I also went to uh, Sonoma Co uh, Community College. All right. Yeah, All took like three classes there. Uh, yeah, love it. I'm from Northern California, so originally. Okay. Yeah, I'm from San Jose. That's where I was born and raised. But I'm okay. I'm a Texas resident. There you go. I hail from Austin. A little more, a little more freedoms in Texas than in California, huh? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but most of my family stayed. You know, they're roughing it. Sure, absolutely. You got to do what you got to do. Right. So uh, please tell me, um, what is your specialty? How do you? How do I find? Do, I, I haven't met you before. Absolutely. And now we're on the air, being broadcast right. to potentially thousands of people all over the nation, and maybe even people listening in a foreign country. All right. So tell us your story and what's going on. All right. Well, my name is Matthew Heath, and I'm from Sonoma County, California. And uh, I'm a political junkie. I got it in my blood. And um, I was a precinct leader for Ron Paul, calling lots of people, knocking on lots of doors, and uh, painting my town Ron. And then uh, Super Tuesday came along, and uh, Ron Paul was cheated out of, of legitimately doing good in my district because he was going to come first and all the people I spoke to in my district. And so he, during a Super Tuesday, shortly after Super Tuesday, he basically said he wasn't going to win the presidency, and so we better take over the party if we want to have restore our constitutional republic. So I started attending my central committee meetings, and I uh, the first meeting I went to, I had a gentleman come up to me, saw my Ron Paul button on, and said, "You need to go down to the voter of registrars. You need to uh, file these papers, and you need to get on the ballot." Well, a few months later, I uh, won my contest, and I was elected onto the Sonoma County Republican Central Committee using the Ron Paul Grassroots organization that did the work in our county to try to get him elected in the uh, Super Tuesday presidential primary. Well, a lot of folks in the party saw this, and they recognized myself, but mostly the volunteer force that we had. Because we, during my campaign, I had folks who made thousands of phone calls. We hung up signs all over the place. Um, we, uh, I had a friend who did a website for myself, and we also sent out an email blast specifically attacking Arnold Schwarzenegger as a rhino governor and uh, promoting Tom McClintock, who was just on the big screen a little bit ago, who's uh, hopefully going to, I hope, going to be a congressman for California and be able to have someone that's going to uh, sit next to Ron Paul and hopefully B.J. Law uh, Lawson for, uh, for lunch sometime you know, next year come January. And uh, uh, so... I then won that election, and the people saw this force that came behind it, so they promoted me and elected me to communications director of the county party. So now we have a libertarian constitutionalist, a classical liberal, so to speak, who is uh, now in charge of the promotion, the publicity, and the marketing of the county, and so which the John McCain folks do not like at all, but that's the way it is because I work hard, and, and the, the, the folks in the party actually don't want rhinos either. Most folks understand they, miss, they might not like Ron Paul per se, but they understand they don't like the rhinos because they're destroying the country. They don't tax and spend, but they borrow, print and spend. And so they understand that they want to get rid of that. So they promote me as communications director. That puts me on the executive committee of the party. I am the no vote on the, on the uh, executive committee. Usually the only no vote, but that's right. I have a model of Dr. Ron Paul to look up to, a voting no on things. So I have no problem with that. And uh, because of this... The, uh, and I volunteer for everything in the Central Committee, and I have this, this volunteer force of folks who are principled individuals who want to retake the country, precinct by precinct, county by county, um, and a part of my, the, the Ron Paul meetup, with now the Campaign for Liberty meetup that I'm a member of. And so I then put my name in the hat for my local school board contest, and lo and behold, I was uh, appointed as elected to the school board. So we now have a gentleman in my local school board where my son's going to go to school in a few years, who is going to uh, vote no on every single parcel tax, who is going to make sure that the books from now on that come through for the elementary school will say republic more than they say democracy, because these are things that are not happening. Um, so uh, that's pretty much my story, but that should be everybody's story out there 
who, who's, who wants to retake our country, which should be everybody watching, because that's what the goal of all of this is, the campaign for liberty. And so we need to take back the party. And this is the way to do it, to attend the meetings, volunteer for as much as you can. You don't have to volunteer for the stuff you don't not principled for. Uh, you volunteer for the local campaigns, the things you, you want to do, the, props that, the, the propositions you're against or for, or uh, you know, the candidates you're for or against, and just get to the position where they'll put you in leadership and we just take over the party. So that's my story and it should be everybody's story. That's a fabulous story. You've been a busy man. This well, is so, so good. Today, so. This is so good. Let me ask you a question. Yeah. Okay, so um, I, I have a, I, the, I just started involving myself in the political process. Okay. This uh, election season was the first time that I was uh, at my precinct convention. Okay. I made it to the, to the senatorial convention. Obviously, everybody did. Yeah. Uh, didn't go on to state. That's okay. Um, one of the one of my observations was that when I I had to go before a selection committee okay. to get elected. Okay. And um, so basically I was questioned by three sure. individuals and I walked up and I'm a veteran of uh, the Navy and the Army. I was Thank a, a service. No, that's okay. It's not like that. Hey, but but it, this is the Republican Party, right? Absolutely. So I walk up and I say, um, I'm a recent military veteran and I support the uh, I, I support the Republican platform or party or something. Something very vague. They they nailed me down and they said, Will you support John McCain? And I looked at these elderly people, there were two gentlemen and a woman, and I said, I can only support somebody with character and integrity. Sure. I didn't say no, I didn't say yes, and frankly, I don't think it's any of their business. Absolutely. I, okay, so there was a screening process that kept me out from the very gate. Through that experience, it became my observation that, well, if I was on the local rules committee, could I change the local rules so that you don't have to swear allegiance to the national, whoever is fed down to us from the national level, okay, that I could retain my independence and my political voice? Uh, because why be in the Republican Party if you have to do and vote for who they tell you to vote for? I mean, I, I'm very confused about this whole political process. Sure. So I said to the elderly man who thought I was a fool, I said, after I said that, they knew that was a no when I said, I will only yeah. support somebody who has integrity. That's they, not John McCain, <laughs> because that's not John McCain. Right. So then the elderly gentleman kind of laughs at me and he says, you do realize this is the Republican Party, right? And I leaned into him as only a small blonde can do. And I said, sir, I said, this is the American political process. And this is the only thing available to me. Do you presume I should go become a Democrat? Wow. <laughs> yeah, so I said this, but I didn't get very far because I told the truth. Other, my, a lot of my friends came and they said, I'll support McCain, which is that kind of violates my principles. It's not that I don't believe lying is, you know, whatever. I don't want to get into that ethical discussion. Yeah, yeah. But the bottom line, my observation was, you know, if we could change the rules at the local level of the Republican Party, could that slow this, uh, this nonsense of being fed down who our candidates will be? Well, well absolutely. Um, one thing is each state is different. Uh, my own, uh, stru the structure in California is it goes per by the county, and there actually is not any, in my county at least, there was no rule that you need to openly support um, any candidate. You cannot publicly, in, in the bylaws of my county, and it specifically states that you cannot openly s uh, support or disparage, excuse me, you cannot openly disparage any no uh, par nominee in a partisan contest. That is a, a Republican. Uh, that is a Republican. So, I want you to restate that, please, and in a, in a, say that another way. All right. Let's see here. Um, the bylaws in my committee basically say that I I cannot. I don't speak have poorly. to. I don't have to say that I support John McCain, but I can't speak bad of him or openly support anybody else, or they can throw me off the executive committee. Okay, that sounds to me like you still lost your voice. Okay. I mean, if we really if you break down the nuts and bolts of it, you still lost your voice with that particular rule. Well, I would agree with that, but in my state, um, I don't have a clear choice of who I would vote for on my presidential ballot. I can now, I still do wear my Ron Paul buttons. They all know I support Ron Paul. I have it all over my vehicles. I had a 4 by 8 sign on my fence still up until this day. Once the convention's over and John McCain officially becomes the nominee, I cannot support anybody but him, but there's nobody else on my ballot on the race that I would support because Chuck Baldwin is not on my ballot and frankly Bob Barr is too conservative for my for my liking. He's not a, he's not a classical liberal by any means. 
I mean, there's many Republicans who, are, who, are, who uh, get the higher Liber graph liber, liber, uh, libertarian rating than Bob Barr does. So it's not an ethical choice for me, because for me it's about securing my life, liberty, and property for my son, for my family, for all Americans by restoring the Constitutional Republic. The only way I can do that is by getting in the room where the discussion is being made and the discussions between the Republicans and the Democrats. Whether I like it or not, that's the only thing that's happening. And so I, whatever I can do to get inside of that room, I'm going to do. Now, does that mean I'm going to give up my principles and support John McCain? No, I will not support John McCain. And everybody knows that. But I will get on the bandwagon for local candidates who are principled, like the fellow who recommended that I uh, run for the Central Committee is running for a local city council race. I will support him for his city council race. I will put all my efforts into that. I will not put my efforts into supporting anybody else. So does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, that was helpful. Um, <laughs> no, it was. It was very helpful. Um, so, so basically what we're looking at here, a strategy is to uh, infiltrate local politics. Bottom line. Bottom line. Bottom line. Yeah, and it, uh, talk about law enforcement a little bit. Do you know your sheriff? No, I do not know my sheriff. Uh, do you have any, that would be a good thing to add to your list of things to do. Get to know your local sheriff. Absolutely. Absolutely. But um, I don't know him. I know who he is. Um, I've, I've uh, never voted for him. I don't necessarily know who he is, but, um, you know, that's something that's going to happen. Now it's, it's kind of keeping myself under the radar, getting myself into a situation, bringing all of the Ron Paul and Minutemen-style people and people who are patriots who believe in life, liberty, and property, as I stated before, into power so then we can open up, take the place over, and restore our constitutional republic. This can not only change our country, but it can change the world. Absolutely. It will change the world because we won't be meddling all over the world. Instead, we'll be meddling in our own country. Where we belong. Thank Absolutely. you so Thank much. You it's much. an honor to meet you and to know you. Good job. Thanks. Hello, sir. Hey, Mike, I'm Mike Hargadon from the 7th District of Maryland. Okay. Uh, Mike Hargadon. Did I say that correctly? Okay, you are on Genesis Communication Network. You're going out on a live webcast to potentially thousands, hopefully millions of people across the nation. And, and we do have viewers uh, in other foreign countries that track uh, this very important Ron Paul movement, everything that's happening. It's critical. So tell us a little bit about, uh, tell us where you're from, tell us your story, and uh, you have the floor, sir. Okay, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Mike Hargadon. I'm, I'm in Maryland. I'm actually, I was inspired to run for Congress because of Ron Paul. I'm a, I'm a dentist. I have four children, and uh, and I just I'm so worried about the way our nation is going. So so we have this incumbent. His name is uh, Elijah Cummings. He's a sixth term. Now he's going for his seventh term. This is socialist. Spends money. Spends money. Spends money. And I think it's time that we stand up to him. He was unopposed last time, and I, and I just figured, well, if we don't stand up to him, there's no sense sitting around and griping about it. So so it comes time where we all have to move out of our comfort zones, and we got to get serious because the country is really in some some really dire straits. And I think if we don't do it now, then, then shame on us because the debt that we're, we're, we're getting into, the wars we're getting into, it's time that we take our Constitution serious and it's time to get behind a guy like Ron Paul. It's been a real blessing just to have him to inspire us. And if we don't move on it, well, then it's our own fault. Outstanding. So this is your first time in politics? Basically, yeah. I, I, was, I was involved with the Constitution Party early on, and I kind of moved, up, moved aside there. And I did run as a, a registered writing candidate in a, in a governor's race that we had in Maryland, just out of principle because the two candidates we had were just totally unacceptable. And I thought, if no other reason, give people somebody to vote for. And I thought, well, we'd step out, and me and a friend registered as writing candidates. Didn't make a big deal, but we did give people a choice, and, and that was important. Okay, I, I want you to uh, educate me about why, what, what is wrong with the two-party system, just having the Democrat and the Republican. Tell me a little bit about your thoughts about that, please. Well, the two-party system, the problem is, is that they can own both parties. I mean, if, if in fact we are being controlled to some extent from a, a one-world group or whatever, however you want to call it, the fact is that if they own both parties, well, then they give us a choice. We get A or we get B, but they own A and B. Unless we open it up and have more people involved, more parties involved, and if we don't have, if we, even if we just have the two parties, we got to run somebody in that other party. And if you look at the, look at the races, many of them are, are uncontested. They just give up, and we can't do that. 
That's outstanding. So essentially, uh, we're moving towards a lot more uh, state power as opposed to individual power, individual sovereignty, individual liberty. And uh, it, there's a very complex uh, situation we find ourselves in. There's monetary issues. There's obviously uh, nation, state relationships, world issues. There's a lot of pressure on a lot of different people. There's a lot of different reasons why we find ourselves in this position that we're in. But basically, the forces, the powers that be, that, and the way things are shaping up is that the American people have have, we're disenfranchised from our own political process to a large degree. Would you agree with that? I would agree with it completely. In fact, you know, what what good is the Constitution if we don't follow it? And if the Constitution calls for our limited federal powers, then why are we letting them just run amok and do what they want? The states should stand up to the federal government, and the states should say, hey, back off. You know, you've, you've overstepped your bounds. That's really difficult to do, though, when you're getting paid from the federal level. <laughs> So, you know, it, this is a very complex monetary issue. I, you know, so I, like uh, was said by one of the speakers today, and I, perhaps it was you, I don't know who said it, um, and I don't know if you've spoken, I've been very busy uh, with this broadcast, but um, the idea that until we conquer this monetary issue yes. of, uh, I've had an inflating dollar, yes, and yes. it's not about prices, it's about the, it's about the loss of value of our dollar, yes. and which causes the inflation of the prices. Yeah, it's kind of like playing poker, and you get a bunch of chips, and you buy your chips, and then right in the middle of the game, the guy's running the bank decides to throw a bunch more chips in because he needs something for himself. I mean, it just inflates. The, it, the dollars is worthless, and it's a damn shame that we let it happen. Okay, sir. Well, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for your service, and keep up the good work. Thank you. Uh-oh. Hello. This is uh, Vin Vincent Campos. Did I get the last name right? Compost, come on in a little bit. Let's get on the camera. Look at it. We got a guy from Texas here. So, Vincent, you are actually an alternate delegate at the RNC. Is that right? Yes, ma'am, I am. Okay, tell us a little bit about your journey. Um, the first time you and I met, you were still on active duty, I believe, in the military. I had just gotten out. Uh, now we're both civilians, and we're working hard on the Ron Paul campaign. And I don't know if it's still true, and I just want to get a plug in for Ron Paul that he received more money from military personnel, uh, active duty, reserve, uh, retired, uh, ROTC, than all the other candidates combined. And that's a pretty significant uh, statement. Wouldn't you say about where the, the heart of the military is, about being deployed all over the world, uh, seemingly doing the, uh, the bidding of the wishes of people other than the American people? Did that make sense? I'm so tired. Yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, their main thing is they just want to come home. Now the soldiers that are active duty right now who have not uh, um, performed a one-year duty in Iraq or a, any kind of tour, they are not aware of what's going on over there. Now most of the veterans of the Iraq war are against it and they want to come home and that's why they're having such a problem re getting these soldiers to re-enlist. Which is kind of frightening because um, our military is set up in such a way that we can actually recruit people from other countries, other nation states, other parts of the world, put them in a uniform and have them serve in our military, serve Uncle Sam. So they, they, there are still pools of streams of body for people to, to fight for uh, the, uh, the wishes of this uh, federal government. Uh, but it, it's not so. If the recruiting goes down in the American population, there's still you know there's a whole world population that they are they are recruiting for. There are people serving in the military from foreign countries. A lot of people are not aware of that. Did you were your time on active duty? Did you serve with anybody that was not an American citizen? Yes, there were a few. Uh, some of them from Philippines, Mexico, uh, South a few of the South American countries, um, but very little. Right, and then my, my experience, uh, I served in the Navy, I served with people that were uh, of Filipino uh, nationality, they, they weren't American citizens. I also served with uh, a, a black man from South Africa who was not an American citizen. So a, a lot of people aren't aware that the military is, it's a very, you know, it's a machine, and uh, the machine knows how to feed itself. So as far as getting people, it's not just about changing the youth of America or, or changing the, uh, the uh, recruiting efforts of the United States. You know, they really got a global... Uh, crop to pick from. Okay, so let's go back to your story. Thank you for going there with me on that. So, okay, so when you went to your precinct convention, did you think you were going to make it all the way to the RNC? I believe I would pro possibly make it to the Texas State Convention. The national iffy. At any point in this process, did somebody ask you directly, 
do you where they would qualify you or not qualify you based on whether or not you would support John McCain? Yes, um, I've had that question within the last about three times within the last three days from uh, many from a few uh, interviews with other reporters. Okay, so reporters, but nobody from within the Republican Party itself. Uh, no, I've not had that question asked of me from the party. They some know who I supported before and some don't know. I'm not hiding anything. If they ask me who I supported, I'm just going to be honest with them. Okay, but now at this point you are uh, ethically bound to vote for John McCain. Do you know, or how does that go for you? I've never made it to the level that you're at right now. And so ethically, uh, to be loyal to the Republican Party, uh, what are your actions? What do you have to do and be? Well, if I'm on the floor as a full delegate tomorrow at the voting, I do not plan on voting for John McCain. It doesn't matter if I am bound for it. They, eth ethically bound, they can say whatever they want, but I'm not voting for John McCain. Okay, I, I can appreciate that. Um, and so did you spend time today over at the RNC? No, I did not. I spent most of my day here. There's no business being conducted at the RNC today, uh, mostly just guest speakers such as uh, Lieberman and Giuliani. Um, is it difficult to, to compare the two facilities and the amount of people at each event? Uh, are there more people at the RNC? Or are there more people at Campaign for Liberty? I'd have to say, after coming from outside just now, there are more people here at the Campaign for Liberty. There are people right now still flooding to get inside the stadium. Right. It's because it, we're, this is, it's a work day. It's a Tuesday. We've had thousands of people here, but I think we're going to reach near full capacity in the coming hours. If not, now they're trying to get in uh, right now. So, okay, now let's go back a little bit to um, when you first discovered Ron Paul. How did you learn about Ron Paul? I have been listening to the Alex Jones Show for the last year since my return from Iraq, and that's how I heard uh, about Ron Paul's through the Alex Jones Show. Okay, that's fair enough. And um, when you uh, sir, joined the military, did you join, are you a Texas veteran, or did you get out of the military in Texas? How did you uh, come to Texas? Well, I'm originally, I was born in Omaha, Nebraska. I grew up in Council Bluffs, Iowa, on the other side of the Missouri River my, uh, most of my life. I joined the Army as soon as I exited high school. Uh, then I was deployed, well, excuse me, um, stationed to Fort Hood, Texas, which I served there from all of 05 until December 05. Then from December 05 to December 06, I served a one-year tour in Baghdad, Iraq. Once I returned from uh, Iraq, then I, that's when I started my activism with the Ron Paul campaign. Okay. Um, when you were in Baghdad, uh, are they at all paying attention to the poll? I know that I wouldn't probably be paying any attention to the politics back in the States if I was in a war zone. Um, what, what was the feeling over in Baghdad? Were people at all engaged in the American political process? Well, at that time, as in 2006, it really wasn't a big deal like it is now. Now, you can't turn the, um, turn the channel without seeing the DNC or the RNC or something about McCain or something about Obama. Back then, the only thing you've seen about politics was uh, Hillary making her addresses in Congress, or excuse me, the Senate, and that was about it. Nothing big. Okay, so um, what about the blocking of information to military personnel? I know that uh, they have secured uh, intranets or whatever. A lot of times you cannot get out on the Internet, and they block certain websites. Uh, uh, do you know that if any of the websites or any radio broadcasts or any information that you were blocked from in Baghdad, while you were serving in Baghdad, was there any time where you didn't have access to 100% of the information you're entitled to as an American? Uh, I was... Well, at that time, I, was, I had access of, uh, to any kind of website I wanted to, you know, go, go to. Same thing with the phones. Now, I'm not over there now, but now it might be a different story. Okay, so, but you never felt that your ability to get information and make decisions was ever hampered by uh, blocking of websites or anything like that. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Um, Let's see. Okay, so what is your agenda for tomorrow? What's going to happen? Are you going over to the RNC tomorrow? Yes, I am. Tomorrow they will be conducting the voting on their presidential candidate, which more likely will be John McCain. 
Okay, and do you, what is your feeling of it? Is it a spontaneous, is it an actual political convention, or is it, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but is it more of a scripted event? What does it feel like over there? Is it all scripted? Is it spontaneous? Give me a feeling of what it's like in there. I would have to say it's 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 uh, scripted because they everybody for the last few months they've been talking about this party unity. And nobody wants to disagree with each other. Although there are Mitt Romney and Huckabee supporters who disagree with with uh, Senator McCain, but they're, right now it's all about party unity. So they're they're gonna the delegates are gonna do whatever the party office holders tell them to do. I see. And